our eighth and last conference uh, on this retreat um, on the theme Ignem Venim in Terrain Terram. I came to bring fire unto the earth, the very words of our Lord, which are, as I reminded us all during the introduction, uh, also the motto of the English College in Rome. We reflected during this retreat on uh, uh, the meaning of martyrdom, especially for us clergy and priests in particular. We meditated on uh, the very etymological definition of the word uh, martyr, which means witness. We were prompted to do that through the uh, uh, tragic um, uh, killing of uh, Father Jacques Amel in Normandy uh, last uh, July. We reflected further on the notion of sign at a natural level and uh, supernatural. And we found that uh, to use signs uh, is not accidental to us human beings, but actually uh, corresponds to our very nature, whose characteristic is that we are rational souls, but united uh, essentially to a body, so that no information reaches our soul but through the mediation of our five physical senses. Whatever uh, signals information in terms of uh, sound or shape or color or, or taste um, our senses gather do not in itself have a meaning. We need to abstract from this information uh, with the use of our intellect the meaning which we then articulate using uh, other signs which are the words put together to form definitions, concepts and uh, uh, at a higher level then, not the natural one anymore, but we are able to uh, apply uh, this for the articles of our faith. We saw that uh, God created the whole material world as a, a, a gigantic and, and superb alphabet whereby he tells us about his splendor. And this wonderful display, we saw that uh, God had uh, used it further when uh, giving us signs, the very word he uses in the Holy Bible, um, about supernatural events and expectations, essentially the coming of the Redeemer. We found that, therefore, it was not uh, to be doomed for us to have to use signs, but it was the very fulfillment of uh, our human nature and the way we are made capable of relating to God and uh, for us coming after the original sin of being saved. We saw that uh, the precursor of our Lord was uh, uh, the most striking embodiment and example of uh, uh, this um, attitude and mission of being a sign, a sign to God, a sign to the Lord, bearing witness to Him. St. John the Baptist, therefore, is the one pointing uh, to Jesus. He is a living sign of, uh, or for the Redeemer to come. Then we uh, meditated on how we can be faithful, and that is uh, to uh, continue on the same uh, theme of being sign, the sense of true witness. We saw uh, as a counterexample the tragic uh, illustration of uh, um, this Jesuit priest in Japan, uh, according to the uh, novel and film recently released by Martin Scorsese, Silence. And um, we examined uh, the um, paradigm of uh, apostasy and the various practical stages 
which make that priest uh, gradually weaker and weaker and weaker until uh, he abandons everything and mistakenly uh, thinks that uh, trampling upon the picture of Christ is uh, pleasing to God, which it is not. We saw uh, as, a, as an antidote what uh, means are at our, at our disposal to function as uh, uh, living signs of God. And uh, I used um, the metaphor of uh, the five stones picked by uh, the young David in uh, the brook and with which he uh, struck Goliath, the giant Philistine, and saved uh, the whole uh, Hebrew army and therefore his whole country. And uh, we uh, meditated on five other stones, uh, all of them being expressions really of Christ himself, which uh, are for us clergy in particular to be used in our battle um, against, uh, against the, the enemy, that is, uh, the devil. Ultimately, uh, the largest and definitive stone uh, thrown by the new David at the head of uh, an enemy more fierce than Goliath is the very stone of the sepulchre, and that is the faith in the resurrection of Christ, which uh, is a promise of our own resurrection, if we are faithful, that is, if we continue to uh, signify Christ and to act as willing and loving and intelligent signs, that is, true witnesses and, uh, if it pleases God, martyrs. So the martyr, taken in its literal sense as a witness, as a sign, points towards a reality greater than himself, not so visible, and it is the mission of the martyr to reveal it. And in fulfilling that mission, he or she, because there are, as we know, many women martyrs, he or she find uh, his or her fulfillment. On this last talk, we briefly ask ourselves, would it not be simpler without signs, though? This is a good question. The brief answer is that uh, um, to do without signs would mean that we have evidence of whatever we are referring to. The sign is there because the reality it refers to is not evident. When the reality is evident, there is no need for a sign. So if truth was evident, if good was evident, then we would not need signs. Everything simpler. But indeed, we see that God does not guarantee success or salvation even without the sign. In the case of Lucifer, as uh, an angel with an intuitive intellect, he was fully aware of God's bounty and sanctity. And that did not prevent him from falling away at a lower level, indeed, for human beings. But what about these crowds who saw our Lord perform so many miracles, which only God can do? And that was their own confession. And still denied him after Palm Sunday. So the use of signs is not an obstacle to salvation. In fact, more positively, it is, as we saw earlier, and according to our human nature, a condition for success, that is, salvation, through humility, through faith, through charity. And focusing now on this clergy retreat, 
on a clerical state. We can say that we are, uh, as other Christ, in a science of these realities. And uh, that a particular sign is our clerical celibacy. The fact that we choose and freely renounce and offer up to God as a beautiful sacrifice the joy of marriage and of the family. This is a sign for the world. It announces the higher joys to come in eternity. And it affirms the actual joy shared with Christ and his members here below in time while we live. What a grace clerical celibacy is and how we must cherish it. We know that even in uh, Christian traditions where the fullness of that witness has been uh, lost still for those who have the fullness of the priesthood that is the bishops they are chosen from among the celibate clergy we are in very good company and without uh, detailing too much let us just uh, take note of the fact that all those connected uh, more directly to the incarnation happen to be um, virgin or abstinent. The very mother of the Lord, our Blessed Lady, was obviously a virgin before, during and after having given birth to Christ. The very precursor of our Lord, St. John the Baptist, was also a virgin. The foster father of our Lord, although truly married to Our Lady, St. Joseph was also a virgin. The beloved disciple, St. John the Evangelist, was also a virgin. All apostles, including St. Paul, are believed to be either celibate or abstinent from the time of their mission. Our clerical and priestly celibacy is therefore a sign, a very eloquent sign for the reality of God's existence and God's presence in our lives as clerics, but also in the life of whoever wants to believe in him and follow him. This sign itself needs manifesting, and this through another sign, which is our clerical garb. Here in England, how striking that the protomartyr of England, St. Alban, a layman, as you know, saved the life of a priest, how? Through taking and donning the very clothes of that priest. Whatever clothes the priest was wearing, they identified him as a priest in the eyes of the faithful and of the persecutors. And that's the very reason why Alban put them on him, so that the priest could escape and that the persecutors would mistake him for the priest and kill him as they did. This is very much like for spouses, the wedding ring. It is a sign, a sign of an invisible consecration. When and why would spouses take off their ring? Traditionally, and still in our priestly fraternity of St. Peter, and this is uh, available to any cleric who wishes to wear um, these uh, clothes. There is a prayer for each of the three main items of clothing, which uh, we uh, say every morning. When we put on the collar around our neck, uh, when we uh, 
dress in the morning. There is a special prayer asking for the virtue of obedience, which is the most intimate sacrifice uh, to God. When we uh, button our cassock, there is another prayer we say for poverty, which is begging God uh, not to be enslaved uh, to possessions of this world, external goods after the internal ones of uh, our free will, sacrificed in obedience. And uh, more external, but certainly also important, when we um, tie the cincture around our waist, uh, a prayer for the virtue of chastity, which is uh, to be free from any exclusive uh, affection in this life. So this is not yet the prayers for vesting before Mass. I'm now only referring to the uh, clothes being worn by the cleric um, during the day. The cassock, in this case, is certainly the livery of the Lord Jesus. We are like uh, heralds coming on behalf of the bridegroom, like St. John the Baptist, and uh, we wear the coat of arms of our king. One could say, well, it's not very colorful as a, as a garment. Indeed, it's all black. The cassock is a shroud, a black shroud. It uh, signals our uh, death to the world. Now, not in a pessimistic or Jansenistic way. It proclaims our death to the world as a, a statement of joy and victory because what the world is in that instance is whatever created goods distract us from seeking God. It is whatever attachments we may feel in our fallen nature for the created goods which uh, may hinder us uh, uh, as we try to attach ourselves to the Creator. So this shroud, clerical shroud of the cassock, is uh, indeed a statement of hope and victory. It is uh, saying that the grace of God is powerful enough to gradually, it's not by magic, but gradually set us free. Needless to say, it is uh, uh, a work of uh, every day and every night. That shroud is prophetic in a way. It uh, points uh, towards uh, the time when, having died in state of grace, uh, we will be forever uh, liberated from uh, our twisted uh, instincts, uh, leading us to pride, to lust, to selfishness. Let us come back to our human nature, the way we are a soul in a body. We must reaffirm very simple things, but the fact that what our five senses perceive of reality is very limited. We tend to say what is real is what I see, what is real is what I touch, what is real is what I hear or taste. By implication, whatever I cannot see, I cannot touch, I cannot hear or taste or, or smell, this is not reality. This is a spontaneous you know, uh, inclination we all have because uh, the report of our senses is more obvious uh, to our perception than things uh, uh, intellectual, spiritual. Let us take an analogy. It's a bit like a child in the womb. The child in the womb, it's now uh, very certain, has a level of sensorial uh, you know, perception. The child reacts to sounds, to touch. And uh, this I'm not sure, but experts could tell us. I think I read somewhere that there might be a very, very dim level of light 
Now, this is a guess, and I'm not sure about this. But there is a certain level of sensorial perception uh, for the child in the womb. Now, imagine the child could think, and if he were to say, well, reality is basically all that I can perceive. We who have been born would tell the child, wait a minute, your range is very limited. In fact, it's just a pre preparation for something much greater when you see the light of day and you see the face of your dear mother and father and all the rest of it. In fact, non-visible realities are to us what perhaps the unseen part of the world is to the child in the womb. Basically, there are things which our senses yet don't reach, but are nevertheless very, very, very real. And these are the spiritual realities, essentially God and the whole economy of redemption. When we now focus on the Eucharistic signs, we know that the externals of bread and wine are what our five physical senses perceive of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Trying to use a bit uh, analogies like that of the embryo. We could see, if we are like little embryos ourselves, in a very limited in the, uh, the range of our perception of reality, we could see that we are like, you know, uh, sheltered within a membrane, and uh, the externals of bread and wine are the limit, they are the curtain or the screen. But there is, of course, on the other side, uh, much, much, much more, and that is the true presence of Christ in the host and in the chalice. If we try and imagine that we are on Christ's side of the Eucharist, the externals of bread and wine could be seen as his garments of self-offering, Christ designed and wishes to appear to us as food and as drink. He wishes to appear to us men as bread and as wine. He does so to tell us that he cares for our needs and that only he can meet our needs. Christ, as we said earlier, is the sign. He is the martyr witness according to his humanity. His humanity is the conjoined instrument of his divinity, but as such as the part of him that appears to our senses, he is the immediate sign of God. God being invisible, of course, we don't see him, but we see the body of Christ, we hear the voice of Christ, and uh, this is how God makes make himself um, perceptible as a sign. And so the fact that the Holy Eucharist is designed as a sign is not accidental. It fits with the very manifestation of Christ the God-man as a sign of God. In both cases, of course, uh, in the case of the humanity of our Lord or the externals of bread and wine, we know that it is a sign which uh, harbors immediately and literally the thing it signifies. The Eucharist is not a symbol for Christ. It is Christ. And the humanity of our Lord is not uh, like a garment of God. It 
directly and immediately belongs to the eternal word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, God the Son. In that sense, uh, the body of Christ is divine, belonging directly to God. But this nature of sign, this characteristic of sign, shared together by the humanity of our Lord and by the Eucharist, therefore shows us that uh, it's part of his plan to be perceived by us and received by us. And so for us clergy, and most of us here, priests in particular, we, we will never uh, you know, have meditated enough on this great mystery of a God invisible to, uh, to us in our human nature, but who wants to come and dwell amongst us and take us back to the Father. And he does so through his incarnation, uh, passion and death on the cross. And he perpetuates uh, this uh, dynamic of uh, condescension, condescension and uh, an elevation of us uh, um, in uh, the sacrifice of the Mass. And we as clergy uh, are called and empowered essentially to offer in his name and person and power this holy sacrifice at the altar. And uh, in conclusion, therefore, we would like to meditate on what is the culmination of the witness of love? That is, that of priests killed in connection with the altar. When a bishop, a priest, a deacon, is killed in direct connection with the holy sacrifice of the Mass, with the sacred place, the sanctuary, with the Holy Eucharist, one can say that the God-given sign is really displayed for man to see in its utmost perfection. We see there Christ professed as sign in his Eucharist as sign and by his priestly minister as the uh, herald and witness of his love. Interestingly, the very first murder of uh, the first just man after the fall was uh, connected with offering a victim as a sacrifice to God. I read Genesis 4, 3, 8. Abel also offered of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offerings. But to Cain and his offerings, which were uh, fruits, he had no respect, and Cain was exceedingly angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to him, why art thou angry, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou do well, shall thou not receive. But if ill, shall not sin forthwith be present at the door. But the lust thereof shall be under thee, and thou shalt have dominion over it. And Cain sent to, said to Abel his brother, Let us go forth abroad. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and slew him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is thy brother Abel? And he answered, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said to him, What hast thou done? 
the voice of thy brother's blood cries to me from the earth. Our blessed Lord refers to another sacrifice, and that is in Matthew twenty-three thirty-five. That upon you may come all the just blood that hath been shed upon the earth, from the blood of Abel the just, even unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom you killed between the temple and the altar. How telling that our Lord refers and connects to the first murder of a man offering a victim to God, Abel, and all the way down to the one who is really a ritual uh, in a sacrificer, and that is uh, this minister killed between the temple and the altar. And very soon after, in the first generation, that is that of the apostles, we have, according to tradition, at least the example of St. Matthew, who was killed at the altar when offering the holy sacrifice. There's a beautiful painting by Caravaggio at St. Luigi de Francese, uh, depicting the sacrifice of St. Matthew, who, again, as a bishop uh, being killed at the altar when offering the divine victim combines uh, superlatively uh, the notion of sign, a sign of the divine. In 1079, in Krakow, we had the martyrdom of the blessed bishop Stanislas killed when offering mass. And uh, closer to us, here in England, of course, the great, the immense and magnificent St. Thomas Becket, who was killed by uh, the knights in the sanctuary of uh, his church in Canterbury uh, in the year of the Lord, 1170. This is for us clergy, um, a providential reminder of uh, the propriety of uh, a full witness to Christ uh, given through our lives in general, our life of penance, our life of sacrifice, including, for instance, uh, celibacy, something radiant and beautiful, but which reaches its uh, fulfillment really at the altar and uh, if we have that grace uh, to uh, give up and offer up our lives uh, uh, in the very act of offering Christ the victim at the altar. Even if we do not die when saying Mass, a good reminder for us is uh, how many times we kiss the altar before turning to the people and uh, uh, telling them that the, the Lord be with them. What do we kiss? Not the altar cloth, uh, not even the altar slab, but uh, the relics of martyrs sealed in that little cavity in the altar stone in the very middle of the mensa of the altar. And in, as a last uh, uh, example, I will now quote uh, Blessed Father Noel Pino, who was a priest uh, martyred during the French Revolution and who happens to be in uh, the next door parish to the one I grew up uh, in France. He was a very zealous, prudent, and holy priest who ministered underground for years, uh, was first arrested, uh, exiled, then came back in secret, was betrayed by a man to whom he had done a lot of good and uh, was then uh, sentenced to death in Angers, in uh, uh, the region of Anjou. 
After 10 days of imprisonment, the rebel, so to speak, was brought before the revolutionary court, which held its trials in a deconsecrated church. This February 21st, the committee was presided over by citizen Roussel. By a horrifying coincidence, this revolutionary officer was an apostate priest who had initially taken the oath, uh, the oath of uh, basically surrender to the Republic, and then left the priesthood. But in Anjou, no one knew his past. After he had given the sentence, Roussel looked at the vestments displayed before the court as evidence that uh, Noel Pinot was a priest, and mockingly suggested to the prisoner, wouldn't you be well pleased to go to the guillotine in your vestments? Yes, agreed the confessor of the faith without hesitation. It would be for me a great consolation. Well, then the other replied, you will wear them and be executed in this get-up. Friday at three in the afternoon. The execution took place that very day. The procession led by drums set out, the judges accompanying the victim dressed in his vestments. The scaffold was erected on the new square called the Rallying Square in the place where once stood the collegiate church of St. Peter, destroyed by the revolutionary town authorities just two days earlier, two years earlier, sorry. Father Gruget, an eyewitness and priest who had remained faithful to the Pope and church, testified. The martyr prayed in a state of profound recollection. His countenance was calm and his brow radiated the joy of the elect. On his lips, so to say, one could follow the canticles of thanksgiving bursting forth from his heart. This Friday, at three in the afternoon, the hour of the Lord's death on the cross, Noel Pinot found himself at the foot of the scaffold. The guillotine stood about where the altar of the church used to be. The sinister platform was transfigured in his eyes. He saw himself at the foot of the altar of the real sacrifice, the altar once again bloody, where in the image of the God of Calvary, a true victim would be immolated. So naturally, the first word of the Mass came to his lips. In Troibo ad altare Dei, I will go to the altar of God. His chasuble was removed, his stole crossed over his chest, he presented himself to executioner. From afar, Father Gruget gave him absolution. A drum roll, the blade fell, the sacrifice was consummated. The soul of the Good Shepherd had reached the altar of God, and so died on February the 21st, 1794, at the age of 48, Father Noel Pinot, the pastor of Luru Bécone. Dear friends, we are now preparing to go back to uh, the Lord's Vineyard. We are preparing to go back to the field where God sent us through our mother, the church, and our bishop or religious superior. Let us make some good resolutions of regular prayer, which is the most important thing, of regular confession that we be ourselves as humble and contrite penitents on the other side of the confessional. Let us take good resolutions of learning and deepening our knowledge of the truth through a good theology and study. Let us be more regular, observant and zealous in the celebration of the Holy Mysteries and particularly the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We are just before Passion Tide now. We know that after Vespers, tomorrow Saturday, the crucifix and images will be veiled in our churches as a sign that Christ is not yet to be seen in his depictions as we now focus towards his death and crucifixion on Good Friday. Let us make provision of faith and let us, as we look forward to Holy Week, also be 
directed in spirit toward the resurrection and Easter, just like in the heart of our Lord on the cross, despite and through all his anguish and suffering, it was at the very bottom joy which was the main uh, feeling and sentiment. Joy for the will of the Father who was fulfilled in his sacrifice. Let that same joy, the one which the world cannot take away, be ours, and this we pray for through the intercession of the True Mother of Christ and our Mother through grace, the Blessed Virgin Mary.